until I was six years old, I wanted to be a locomotive engineer because I thought steam engines were really great. They were really cool. For my sixth birthday, a family friend took me for a ride in a Cessna 140. And I thought that was even cooler and it was certainly a lot cleaner than working with steam engines. So that's when I decided I wanted to become a pilot and I just worked my way towards that. Read books like Stick and Rudder and and uh, even built myself a little instrument panel in my bedroom and, and uh, just lived and breathed flying and that really hasn't changed. <laughs> My name is Frank Hale. I uh, grew up in Salem, Oregon, and I kind of did the uh, uh, whirlwind trip around the country, uh, moved from Oregon to Texas, lived there, had a little side trip to Turkey for two and a half years, then moved up to Michigan, and then moved to Montana. I've been in Kalispell for 16 and a half years now, and, and I love it here. Started working at the airport with two of my friends when I was uh, 13 years old. That was back in 1963 and uh, we weren't very smart. We'd spend all day washing an airplane for a 20 minute ride. And uh, then the, the owner of the FBO called us in and said, look guys, if you uh, really want to, you're stealing our business. One of the things we do is wash airplanes and if you really want to fly, you go to work for us. We'll pay you a dollar an hour credit towards flying, no cash, just credit towards flying. And my little mind says, this is great because the rule in our house is 50% of everything I made had to go into the bank. And I couldn't put flying credit into the bank. So I, that's what I used to, to fly. At that time, it cost me $14 for a lesson. It was $10 for the airplane and four for the instructor. And I actually started taking uh, lessons in 1963 and soloed in 64 on my 16th birthday. Got my private on the 17th birthday, and I had a commercial at about 18 and a half. The B-17 was probably my favorite airplane when I was young. You know, I grew up, you know, not too long after World War II. Some friends of mine were involved with the CAF, which at that time was Confederate Air Force. It's now Commemorative Air Force, but they were involved with a B-17 called Texas Raiders. And for five years, they bugged me to you know, get involved and I always had an excuse, you know, it takes too much time, I can't afford it, you know, some sort of excuse. So anyway, they said, you know, we're, we got a uh, air show in Bay City this weekend, why don't you come with us? Okay, so I get in the airplane, we go up and buzz a little field up in Angleton, Texas, which is pretty fun. I was sitting in the nose at that point in time. Then they said, well, come on up to the cockpit, get in the seat. And as soon as I flew that airplane, I was hooked. And circumstances led me to be at the airplane at eight o'clock the next morning, and I took my check ride and got a B-17 type rating. You know, we offered the Warbird Experience rides in the B-17 where people could, you know, pay. We had an exemption to the regulation that allowed us to carry people for hire. And they get a chance to get inside the airplane while it's flying. And, you know, other than takeoff and landing where they're seated, the rest of the time they're up all over the airplane, up into the nose. They can stick their head up through the top turret. They can look out the waist windows. It, you know, it's just, it's an experience. We certainly never had anybody ask for their money back. You know, the, the veterans post-war didn't talk about their experiences. They saw things that, that, you know, teenage kids or young adults should never have seen. I was on tour with Collings Foundation in Klamath Falls, Oregon. It wasn't a very busy stop. It was fairly quiet. And this guy, a, a pretty frail, a fairly short gentleman, walked up to me. He's using a walker and he's talking to me. And I can't understand what he's saying. It's like he'd had a stroke. And uh, he kept pulling on my shirt and trying to drag me back towards the back of the airplane. And his son was there. And I said, was your dad the ball turret gunner? And he says, yeah. He says, I think he's trying to see if you'll open the turret. And I said, well, we normally don't do that, but it's quiet. And I said, uh, I'll get the flight engineer to come open it. So anyway, the flight engineer came, opened the door, and this guy is out of his walker and inside that turret in about a minute. And he's talking like you and I are talking. You know, complete, you know, you wonder what kind of 
thing is happening between his brain and his, you know, the rest of his body that allowed him to talk. And he's telling the stories about, you know, his combat missions and how the turret worked. And pretty soon there's this huge crowd gathered around the Bombay because we're always li all listening to him. He must have been in there at least an hour and a half. And at the end of the day, he gets out, and gets his walker and shuffles off. And his son said, we haven't heard him talk like this in years. Can we bring him back tomorrow? I said, absolutely. So the next day, same thing. Guys back in the turret telling stories, talking like we're talking. In my 56 years of flying, you know, I never dreamed that I get to fly equipment like I do now. The 17 is big, heavy airplane with very little avionics in it you know, designed for an entire different mission than, than a CJ. I'm 73 a month from being 74 years old. I've been flying since I was 15 years old. Been working in an airport since I was 13 years old. You know, it's just fun and I have never grown tired of it. Yes, there are days when it's hard work, but most of the time it's just pure fun. I'm honored to be able to do what I do and to enjoy it. I tell people that I fly for free, they pay me for waiting around. <laughs>